Hey, what's up? I, uh, I, know, I just wanted to tell you about this guy that I knew. I, you know, a lot of you guys know I worked at Medieval Times. Um, gosh, a long time ago. Uh, it was fun, you know. I got to play with swords and ride horses and do all that good stuff. But the culture there was weird, man. I mean, there were just some people there that I just didn't get. There was this huge group of people who would play World of Warcraft all the time. And, man, like I used to play video games or whatever, but, like, this was just a totally different thing. Online, universe, create a character, and and I swear it was... Every single day, huge groups of people were talking about leveling up their 69 mage and all kinds of stuff. And look, if you if you play more power to you. But there was this one guy who was all about it and and he talked about it and he self admittedly played this more than he was involved in his real life. He identified more with this weird online character that he had than he did with his own person. And what he said is like, first of all, he worked at Medieval Times, right? I mean, we're already, you're dressing up as somebody else as a knight and you're doing, I don't know, you're (laughs) playing a character. And then... He came home and he had his TVs, a whole bunch of TVs set up and the the best sound system and all of that stuff. And and he felt like he was actually there. In fact, most of his relationships with friends were online and playing this game. In fact, the dude was married and he said that the most time that he spent with his wife was in the game, that they would sit back to back and meet in this game. And I'm like, that's just crazy. I, I don't get that. I'm certainly not the kind of person to do that and uh and so i guess he would play all night long and then he would finally go to sleep in the early morning and then when he was done he would wake up and come and be a night he said he he felt like his real person like he he identified more with this character than he did with his real self and sadly i don't think that's all that unique i think that's something that happens all the time. I mean, all the time we hear about these people who, I don't know, maybe you've heard of them, are on Instagram all the time, or they're on their phone all the time, or they're on Facebook all the time, or Snapchat all the time, or a video game all the time. And maybe you've heard somebody tell you once, hey, you're always on your phone. How come you're always talking to somebody on your phone? You're always looking up something. You're always playing a game. You're always on a video game or something like that. Chances are you've heard something like that. Mostly because our whole culture is filled with with movies and books and TV shows and stuff like that where people get lost in this virtual world. In fact, I was just telling somebody yesterday who's totally in the books. Like you, I, I, I honestly think you love the characters in the books more than you love real people and and i don't think this is too uncommon you know because it's easy right it's easy for us to get lost into a screen it's easy for us to get lost into a book because because it's safe then i can pretend to be a person in this area or whatever in this app or you know whatever it is i can pretend to be somebody there and most of the time because I don't like who I really am. Maybe I don't even know who I really am. And so I don't know how to behave as me because sometimes I don't even know me. And and the me that I know, I I don't know that I like. So sometimes it's easier just to kind of try to get my hair just right and to take the picture all looking good or uh, and wait for the likes to come through or the comments to come through. Or maybe it's easier for me to just kind of check out and play a video game into the wee hours of the morning maybe with headphones on so that I can't hear whatever's going on in the next room and then I'm tired and, and school stresses me out and whatever it is and I'll just get my head locked into some Netflix show or you know whatever it is and actually behaving as a true and real self is tough and it's crazy that in the book of Ephesians we turn to this passage you know we've been going through it and we we talk about the gospel and what that means and we finally get to this place where where we 
understand who it is. And last week we talked about what it means to put on a new self. To put on a new self. And this week, it starts talking about what that means. You know, in, in Ephesians 4, starting in verse 24, it talks about true righteousness and holiness. Put on your, true, your new self in true righteousness and holiness. You guys thought about how scandalous this is? True? What do you mean true? I mean that there's a false? Or, or a righteousness? Does that mean that there's a... If that's right, does that mean that there's a wrong? That you can live in truth or you can live in falsehood. That you can live rightly or you can live wrongly. And it's like this whole time it's saying, hey, this is who you are. Where, where, where the gospel has said, you have been adopted as sons. Where Ephesians has talked about this idea of you now have an inheritance with him. That all of these things are happening because you are made new in Christ. You are a new creation. So put on a new self. And there was times when I was working at Medieval Times where I'm looking at that dude and I just kind of wanted to shake him. And I wanted to go, bro, like live in the real world. Live in the life that you have been given, the life that surrounds you. Hang out with your wife face to face and not back to back. Talk to us about the things that are going on in this world and not in some fantasy world. And I feel like in this pastor, pastor God's going, hey, let me shake you up a little bit. Go stop living in your life that doesn't exist. I made you new. I put the Holy Spirit in you. I dwell in presence inside your body. And so why don't you just live out of that new self? And he starts going through categorically one thing after another. And it starts with this idea of lies and truth. I mean, maybe you guys won't get very far. You kind of start there and you'll get to this place where you get to of lies and truth and, and it's hard to move on because maybe you're the kind of person who, man, you haven't told the truth in a long time. In fact, you're so prone to making stuff up that it just comes naturally. Maybe it started with an embellishment or started exaggerating something. You wanted somebody to respect you or like you or, you know, whatever it is. And one thing after another, you do that so much and it's just in second nature. In verse 26, he gets on into anger. Man, that's rough, right? And what would it be like if we were slow to anger, quick to listen? What would it be like if, if this is our true self, but sometimes we're so prone to just wanting to get our way and wanting to do things the way that we see fit. We get so mad at everybody else for having a different way of thinking or, or for putting something on us that we don't think should exist. And in 28, it gets into theft and generosity. And I, I don't know how many of you guys are stealing stuff. And so maybe you're thinking, ah, that's not me, but... And I wonder how many of us are truly generous, are, are sharing our, our time with other people, are sharing our self with other people, are sharing our possessions with other people, sharing our faith with other people. And then it gets into something really tough, and it's language. Man, I know some of the language that's out about there. I know I'm not just talking about swear words. I'm talking about things that cut way deeper than a four-letter word. Lies, gossip, bitterness, malice, slander. When somebody's going to take somebody's reputation and just rip it all apart. And what I find really interesting, this starts in verse 29, and it's in the context of language where it says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that God, that God, can be grieved, can be saddened. He can, he can have his heart broken. And then this happens through language. Man, it's crazy to me that, that the words that I speak are so powerful that it can affect the, the emotions of my God. And in the beginning of chapter 5, it starts talking about being imitators of God and saying, you know what we're supposed to do is mimic Christ. To mimic God, to, 
to look at who he is and, and try to be just like that. I mean, we should, we should be uh, little kind of clones of him, little, little baby versions of Jesus. And I wonder if people look at us, are they seeing that little baby version of Jesus? Are they seeing that Holy Spirit that dwells inside of us? Are they seeing God? Or are we too busy trying to get them to see us? And then, then it gets into something a little real. In verse 3, and it starts talking about what we're doing with our bodies. Man, I, I don't know if it's my place to pry, but maybe it's a good place to jump in in a discussion in your groups. Maybe talking about you know, what kind of pulls is, sexually immoral, is sexual immorality having on you. Is there truth here, too? If God defines truth and right and wrong and there is righteousness, there is true righteousness or true holiness, is it possible that there's a truth about what you do with your body? And then it gets in like, hey, let's be real. Are, are you in or out here? Are you in or out? And then it's talking about the kingdom of God and, and some won't inherit the kingdom of God and some will. Maybe this is the place to camp out. Are you in or are you out? Uh, finally, it gets talking about substances. This is real. This is practical. Sometimes this isn't something best done in a whole group, but this is best done one-on-one. And maybe if you guys have enough trust built in your group, Trust to speak the truth, to do it in love. Maybe you can start talking about things like, hey, but I've been lying. Hey, but I see that you've been just super angry. Yeah, hey, I, I gotta be honest, I am not generous with my faith. Guys, I think some of the things that I'm saying about other people are grieving God. And saying, oh, you know what? You know what I've seen in you, though? I've seen these times where you are mimicking God, where the Holy Spirit is living through you. You can say, hey, there, there are times where I'm slipping in the idea of sexual immorality. I'm looking at things that I shouldn't be looking at. I'm doing some things that I shouldn't be doing. Maybe you guys can get to the point of, like, what, what does it mean to be in and out? What does it mean to be so full of the Holy Spirit that you're overjoyed? Guys, I love you. And what I love about this passage is that he's talking to Christians. And he's not saying, hey, if you do all of these right things, then you will be saved. But, but what he's saying is, you are saved. And so don't live some fantasy life. Don't live some life of, of what you put on a screen. Don't live some life that other, somebody else is living. Don't live some life that you used to live. Don't live some life of a book or a movie or a novel or whatever it is. And live Christ. God sealed you in the Holy Spirit. And God has made you new and unique and gifted you in powerful ways to live His will in this place. I encourage you guys to read it. See what this says. What does it say about God? What does it say about people? And what can I do about it? I love you guys. I'll talk to you later. Bye.